Hello and thanks for showing up for Spending the War Without You, which is still coming to you from New York City. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral lands of the Lenape, Manhattan's original inhabitants. Of course, there are no Lenape here anymore since they were relocated to Oklahoma in 1830 in the Indian Removal Project, sending them all off on the never-ending Trail of Tears. Today's talk is called The City, the fifth lecture in the series, and it has a few subtitles. Politics, Stories, and the Audience, Prison, Teachers, the Imaginary, the Dreamlike, and the Invisible. Cities are dreams. There's Motor City, there's the Big D, the Big Easy, the Big Apple, and my favorite name belongs to Venice, the Bride of the Sea. There's the City of Light, the Eternal City, the Emerald City, and here's a map of the unattainable celestial city in Pilgrim's Progress, always shining in the distance, outside of time. I come from the Windy City, also known as the Second City. When I was a kid, TV was live, and all the news came from New York. Every night they'd begin with, good evening, at six o'clock. I'd look at the clock, it was five o'clock. And I thought, I have to go to New York, where it's always later, darker more exciting. A few years ago, I was asked by the Encyclopedia Britannica to write about my city, New York. Not facts and history, but really just how it feels to live here. So I wrote about what New York sounds like at night. And it started with a drum roll, the sound that garbage trucks make when they roll over loose sewer covers and make them rattle like so many snare drums. Like the punchline in a bad joke. You know, the best way to see the city is at night from the air, when you can see the structure of the grid and all the canyons are all lit up. But New York City began as a walled city. The wall was built by the Dutch to keep the English and the Native Americans out, but it was flimsy and wooden and it collapsed very soon after it was put up. The real center of the city was the Wall Street marketplace, more precisely, the slave market, where trade began in 1626. Then almost 100 years later, in 1711, the city council made Wall Street the city's first official slave market, and 100 years after that, in 1812, slavery was still launching an economy and a country in which one in four U.S. presidents have been involved in human trafficking and slavery, and 70% of the wealth is in the hands of 10% of the people. And I'm thinking of the history of walls, and there's Jericho at 10,000 years, the oldest continually inhabited city that began with a defensive wall. And here's an early map that stresses how strong the defenses were. And then there's the opposite idea in Chetalhiok, a Neolithic city with its mud brick beehive structure. No wall, no center, no streets. Everyone just meets up on the roof. And then there's New York, the city of tomorrow, the capital of the empire where there's nowhere to go but up. So how do you learn a city? First of all, just by wandering. There's the flaneur, the main character in books by Baudelaire, Balzac, and Robert Walser, and Walter Benjamin. The one who wanders around was no particular destination, but these walkers were writers, and the flaneur was also a raconteur who put cities into words. And I'm thinking of Invisible Cities, Italo Calvino's book, made of all kinds of cities, more of a puzzle than a book. A book made of many detours. In this book, the explorer Marco Polo describes cities in the empire to the emperor Kublai Khan, at first only in gestures and then in words and finally in stories. And it's full of tables and parables and metaphors and games about language and dreams. This is one of my favorite books because digression is its real subject. The descriptions of the cities are framed by a long conversation between the emperor and the explorer. And at one point, the two are playing chess and the explorer begins to point out microscopic things in the ebony and maple squares on the board. He says, look at the direction of fibers in the wood and here's a knot where a bud tried to come out in a premature spring day prevented by the frost from the night before. And look at this little whirl, probably a larva's nest, maybe a caterpillar. He looks up. 
Is this part of the game? And if so, who's winning? Before long, Polo was back to talking about ebony forests, about rafts laden with logs that come down the river's docks of women at the windows. But I digress. And then there's Guy Debord, the philosopher and founding member of the Situationist movement. In his 1967 book, The Society of the Spectacle, he wrote that cities as well as social relations have been replaced by the representation, and it's a one-to-one -one scale model. He describes something he calls the derive, literally a drifting through, but the city he's drifting through is a city of signs. And these are cities and signs that are describing and advertising themselves nonstop. And as things speed up, desire and fear and speed become a new kind of concrete poetry. Now, New York City has been made of signs for a long time. But as Coca-Cola went from its medicinal beginnings as a nerve tonic through classic Coke, New Coke, and Coke Zero, it became an icon, even more than a drink. Now, some people come to the city to make a name for themselves. Others come to be anonymous or to disappear in the crowd. Sometimes I think I move to a machine, not a city. A kind of fame machine made to announce and replicate and trumpet people's names. It's almost a quaint idea that this mechanism was also a city. There's a project called Midnight Moments that shows artist films on 60 screens in Times Square from 11.57 to midnight for a month. And I got to show some scenes from my essay film, Heart of a Dog, which I thought would look really out of place, but nothing looks out of place there since it's actually not a place. This event was also a concert for dogs, but that's another story. Lots of neighborhoods aren't at Vegas yet. Sometimes the whole city seems like an opera set with no plot, just lots of short fractured scenes. A man jumps out of a cab, waving an umbrella. Then there's a sudden downpour and a loud siren. Then a homeless man stumbles out of a doorway and a woman sprints across the street, her wig sliding off. But walking in New York depends on the neighborhood. You can't drift in the grid. Midtown walking is purposeful and strategic, a dance with lots of steps and moves to avoid colliding people who are talking on their cell phones. Sometimes it's better to sit instead of walk. And there's the new pedestrian who just sits in the middle of the street malls and lets it all go by. A trend started half a century ago by old people who sat all day in the middle of Broadway on the Upper West Side with traffic whizzing back and forth around them Think I be singer and friends in their winter coats. I've also seen some ritual walking, the most extreme being on Manhattan Henge, when twice a year the sun lines up with the grid. Once on Manhattan Henge, I saw the director, Bob Wilson, walking with some friends from east to west across Manhattan at the excruciating slow pace of his plays. He said it took seven hours. Recently, a huge sign went up across the river from Ian Hoboken, a giant bright red W on top of a tall building. The W Hotel chain began as a club on Lexington 98th and was built into a chain of upscale lifestyle hotels, and now they're trying to update their whole image by blasting their W all over the place. This particular W casts a long red path that stretches across the Hudson like a garish parody of a sunset. And it's there all day too. They never turn it off. 
I sleep in a bed facing the Hudson with a bird's eye view of the river. This logo is the last thing I see before I go to sleep and it brands its red hot shape onto my brain. And then all night, cowboys are chasing me with ropes and red hot irons. And finally, it dawned on me how I could get rid of this nightmare. I began to see the giant W as a huge map, a cardinal point, a way to orient the W as in the mythical West, the wild West, the Buddhist Western lands. And behind it over there to the West is the rest of America. It made sense until one night I realized it was also the nickname for our 43rd president, also a cowboy. Cowboys ain't easy to love and they're harder to hold. They'd rather give you a song, diamonds or gold. Low star belt buckles and old faded Levi's and each night begins a new day. You have a good night now. If you don't understand, I was back to seeing the W. I was desperate until I noticed that if you looked carefully at the reflection in the water, the W was upside down. In other words, it was an M. It was a very short ambigram. Like the longer mom and wow, it had become part of the mysterious world of code. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Debor also referred to the lesh vitrine or window shopping. What it means to see our reflections as we pass and to picture ourselves in that world. Now that so many window displays are screens or have screens, it makes shopping harder. You don't know what's in stock and what's just a picture of something. You find yourself in limbo, shopping for pictures of shirts and pictures of shoes. And I'm thinking back to November 1980 and one of my favorite artworks by Kit Galloway and Sherry Rubinowitz. And it was called Hole in Space and it was a video piece way before its time, way before VR and concepts of real time. These artists used television to make a live link between LA and New York using a window in a shopping center in Los Angeles and a window in Lincoln Center. And this was back when the coasts were much farther apart and crowds gathered in front of the windows, waving to each other in the first electronic family reunions. Now in the last two years, New York has a strange post-war feel. There are odd shortages in things like paper, vinyl, fuel, and spinach. Ships are moored out in harbors waiting to unload the containers. There's also a shortage of containers. Now, not very many tourists around these days, mostly locals. And you can still look right through the Midtown office buildings with their emptied out offices. Not only the desks are gone, but the AC and the lights are gone too. People don't seem to be coming back anytime soon. On the street, people are laughing a little too loud and there's something kind of hysterical about it. Meanwhile, the city has turned itself inside out. It looks more like New Orleans, a party city. It's back in business, but with a lot of things still kind of missing. Some people call the new outdoor structures dog houses, a combination of trailers and uh, diners. I think they look kind of a lot like barges in Amsterdam when they're parked on the street, replacing the parking lanes. So now cars have to circle endlessly. And anyway, some are going for like the Alpine hut look and others are trying more for the outdoor picnic. And they're, some are a, a lot like dollhouses. And others just have, you know, seasonal themes. And the ones I really love though, are the ones that are already sort of falling apart, kind of in ruins or on their way there. Seems like a lot of people have decamped to the country, the way the plague can empty out cities. 
And now, having discovered there's no opera in their Hamlet, they're circling back. Or they're just running back and forth or in and out and trying to decide what to do. And I'm thinking of those little medieval Italian towns that were built like forts and they were always at war with each other. And they had lots of battle strategies. They would do things like when the enemy was coming, they would all leave, but they didn't want it to seem like they deserted the town. So they put their horses' shoes on backwards and they rode out to a safe place so that when the enemy stormed the fort, it wouldn't look like they deserted, but instead, like a lot of reinforcements had just arrived. Also, they were really good at using animals as weapons. When they were attacking a town, they would light the tails of wildcats and boars and then point them towards the town like living bombs. And the animals would start running away from the fire in their tails and towards the town that was under siege. But I digress, actually. If you've heard any of these talks, you've figured out by now that digression is my method. Dropping the thread, putting off the end just a little bit longer, and trying to live in the limitless present. But speaking of siege, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving out of the city to a house I have at the end of Long Island where I go to escape and take hikes and try to write these talks. And in the opposite direction, was a 15 mile line of cars and trucks, flying flags and honking and people yelling. And they're yelling out the home addresses of their enemies in Congress and calling them traitors and screaming words like payback. And I'm thinking of Paul Revere, who went galloping through all the little New England towns, warning the citizens that the British troops are coming. And he's riding and yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming. And, and the people in New England are sitting in their smoky little cottages and thinking, wait a second, I'm British? You're British? Isn't Paul British? I mean, pretty much we're all British here. So exactly who is coming? It seems like we've been waiting couple of hundred years now for the enemy to show up. And since they never did, we finally decided we might be the enemy ourselves. So how did this happen? I'm thinking of Naomi Klein, who wrote about how Americans make war in her book Shock Doctrine, and how we did this in about 17 different countries. Basically, the technique is you come into a country, destabilize it, create chaos, and then take over. And I'm haunted by something she said on the last page. What if we do this in our own country? And in the chaos of my dreams, there's a ghostly war that never ends. Always storming the walls of a city. Always trying to get in. Get in. Get inside. And now here we are. The next election season has started like a freakish early spring, when buds pop out in January, shrivel in February, and give up the ghost in March. And all the candidates begin again to tell their stories about how they see the future and how the world used to be and what it could become. And they spin these stories, and the stories get faster and shorter until they're honks and tweets and blasts that are almost instantly labeled fake. And Eventually, you have no idea who's telling the story or who started it, and you realize we're drowning in our own stories. 
Yeah, this map. This is long road. This dirty train. This is this map. map. This bridge. This is long road. This is dirty train. As I can see the future, and it's a place about 70 miles east of here, where it's lighter. Linger on over here. Got the time. I've found out the hard way that making political art can be strident or start to be a kind of propaganda, seducing you with beauty and stories and answers that can just be too easy. As an artist, I'm not trying to fix things or looking for ways to make the world a better place. Or at least, I don't admit it in public. When people say they want to make the world a better place, I think, better for who? For you and your friends? Plus, I don't really like being told what to do. I think. You don't even know me. Don't tell me what to do. Now, in the 90s, I did some personal service ads, supposedly as a way to promote an album I'd done, and they had nothing to do with the record. They were infomercials about the national debt, how much women are making as opposed to men, other issues, but because I was dancing around in them and selling the album, the record company didn't really seem to notice. You know, recently, a lot of people have been talking about changing the national anthem to America the Beautiful. Now, I don't know really if that's such a great idea. I mean, I really like the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, it is kind of hard to sing, though, with all those arpeggios, and you're out at the ballpark and the fans are singing away, and it's sort of pathetic, really, watching everybody try to hang on to that melody. The words are great, though. Just a lot of questions written during a fire. Things like, hey, do you see anything over there? I don't know, there's a lot of smoke. Say, isn't that a flag? Hmm, couldn't say, really, it's pretty early in the morning. Hey, do you smell something burning? I mean, that's the whole song. It is a big improvement, though, over most national anthems, which are in 4-4 time, you know, we're number one, this is the best place. I also like the B-side of the national anthem, Yankee Doodle. Truly a surrealist masterpiece. Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Now, if you can understand the words to this song, you can understand anything that's happening in the art world today. There's a downtown fair singing out proud Mary as she cruises Christopher Street. And some southern queen is acting loud and mean where the docks and the bad lands meet. This Halloween is something to be sure of. Especially to be here without you. There's a Greta Garbo and an Alfred Hitchcock. Last week I went to the Halloween parade. It's more polite now than it was in the raunchier days when the parade went sleepwalking over to the most haunted place in the city, Washington Square Park, where 20,000 people, some say 100,000 people, are buried standing up in the potter's field and burial grounds for victims of yellow fever. And there's the oldest tree in New York over there on the corner, an elm that was once used as a gallows. I walk around the city and see all the neighborhoods that were part of my past. And I make a map of the city 
the corner where I said goodbye to her forever, night court where I took European friends on jet lag crawls through the city, the park where we fought, the corner restaurant, gone now. But when you're walking in neighborhoods like this, time compresses and it expands. And some of the things that I remember never happened to me. They happened to other people. Now I'm on the north side of Sheridan Square and it's a Saturday morning long ago and I see Charlie, who's a skeleton and his face is covered with the purple sores of Kaposi sarcoma. And he's waving from his convertible. He's off to the ocean to see it with his Irish setter. Then a double-decker bus comes through my mind. It must be five years later now. And a man with a megaphone on top of the bus is saying, we are passing the Stonewall Inn, the historic site of the riots of the late 60s, from a time when homosexuals were persecuted. In the park now, there's some white statues, but mostly what's left of this time is stories in the city of words. But what's the point of remembering things anyway? Isn't it just a kind of hoarding? You can't go back anyway. Why not do as I do? Let go of your thoughts as though they were the cold ashes of a long dead fire, said John Cage. Sometimes it takes a real effort to forget. Once I was in a plane crash and soon after that, I joined a kind of crash club. And in our meetings, we told the story of our crashes again and again until they became familiar and finally boring. And then they just disappeared, almost. Other things from the past have a way of staying around and even becoming more real. My childhood, distant and folkloric. My marriage, dreamlike and perfect. But walking in the city is literally seeing the new layers built on top of old ones, always changing what's underneath the surface, like memories that change their nature and they're affected by new things and by the act of remembering itself. All the neurological shifts of remembering changing things into remembered things. Meanwhile, the whole country is wired in new ways. I need scotch tape. I don't go to the corner store to get it. There is no corner store. My roll of scotch tape comes overnight by plane from a warehouse in the Midwest, wrapped in bubble wrap and sealed in a large cardboard box. Outside the city limits, there are so many new ghost towns now. The malls, the drag strips, the big box stores, come and gone, and always the competition, like extreme sports sibling rivalry. What is the philosophy of late capitalism? Two hikers see a hungry bear on the trail ahead of them. One of them takes out one of his running shoes and he starts to put them on. You can't outrun a bear, says the other. The first one says, I know. I just have to run faster than you do. I come to say you will and then you won't. And I'm thinking back to 1921 to Tulsa, the Greenwood district where black Americans had their own affluent financial center called Black Wall Street. And on June 1st, the district was looted, burned, and erased by white rioters in a massacre that was a putrid mixture of envy, arson, hatred, greed, and murder. Dream like abandoned cities. Local police forces armed with military-grade weapons. And still, we like to think of ourselves as the strongest, most attractive country in the world. We're like the beautiful girl in high school who says, people don't like me because I'm beautiful. And then there are the flyaway cities, the tent cities that are everywhere now. Some cities give the camps power and water and places to charge your cell phone. And some do not. A 
few years ago, I was asked to do a concert for people in the refugee camp on the island of Lesbos. And I said, don't they need food and water? No, they need music, said the promoters. I visited the camps and brought a lot of music for them to listen to on headphones. Now, the refugees I spent time with were mostly mothers and children from Syria and Lebanon. And everyone was like routed into tents. And it was the little girls who broke my heart. They didn't go out, but they lived in the back of the dark parts of the tent doing small craft projects, or when they did go out, it was to carry water or to sweep. The little boys learned new languages. They went out to play. They spent more time with their mothers who were already depending on their little sons. Now, one day I was sitting in the tent and a little girl wrapped in a huge brown rag came up to me and started just slapping me in the cheek over and over and over. And I just sat there and she slapped me harder and harder and went on and on. And I was looking directly at the rage in her face until a volunteer came over and pulled her away. And okay, I can hear the voices saying, yes, we're working to change this. We're making progress in women's rights. But this is now and the world over, subtle or overt, women and girls still have less value than men and boys. And even as I say this, I am aware that it rings like a complaint instead of a fact, and it lacks the resonant authority, the gavel, the final word of the boss. And even if a woman is genuinely in charge, she's seen as playing a role, as an exception. Or an imposter. All complicated by the story of capitalism building up, then going to war again by appealing to the gung-ho patriotism of young men who just want to be part of something. And what's that sound? Why is everybody always fighting? Who is coming and what are the stakes? What is shifting? Other far-flung rhetorical questions pounded at my door. Facts and opinions appeared in snippets and fragments as if they might contain the answers to some of these baffling and monumental things. The disappearance of birds and insects, the unanswered questions, the annihilations, the extinction. As a musician, I travel between cities. So for example, I don't say I'm going to Germany, I say I'm going to Berlin. Uh, it's not going to Holland, I'm going to Amsterdam. And I have more in common really with people in Madrid than Tallahassee, Florida. Now these routes and connections between cities are the silk roads of culture traveled by musicians, orchestras, dance companies, and art exhibitions. And as the cultural world opens up again, it's the cities more than the countries that are taking the lead, making sure artists can travel without bureaucracy and bans. And I'm thinking back to October 2001, and I was doing a show in Frankfurt. And after the show, I went back to the hotel alone, and it was a solo show, and there was no one to celebrate with, so I was feeling a little blue, and I, I decided just to go to bed. But I couldn't sleep because there was a really noisy party going on in the lobby. So I decided, instead of being mad, I would just get dressed and get up and go down to the lobby and try to blend in with the party. Now, when I got to the lobby, it was packed with these very stylish Frankfurters dressed in black, but it seemed a little more formal than just a regular party. So I said, so uh, what's this uh, party about? And they said, oh, we're the firemen. And I made the universal uh, expression of uh, tell me more. And they said, yes, this is a, a benefit for the New York firemen to get them more equipment to show support. And I thought, what 
kind of city sees itself as so international, so much a part of the world, that they help people from across the ocean. You know, I haven't been doing much touring since the pandemic, and I've been trying to imagine other ways to do music, and it's made me think of New York a little differently, too. A while ago, I decided to write some site-specific music about New York, and so I sat in the plaza in Lincoln Center for weeks, staring at the fountain and the buildings and trying to think of what to write. And it rained every day and the heat was suffocating and there was a constant roar from the HVAC machines and the monolithic office buildings surrounding the plaza. And I watched with binoculars as the lights switched on floor by floor and workers are gathering stacks of paper and rushing them over into shredders. And what could I write about these buildings? And the things that people are doing in them at night. And who is this even for? So let's talk about the audience. Who's out there and what are you saying to them? When I do concerts, I always light the first few rows so that I can see who's there. Now audiences tend to think they're invisible, so it's easy to learn editing from them. If enough people in the front row are dozing, I tend to take those parts out. Not because I want to be popular, but I work in an art form that has to work in the moment, not later, or at least well enough to remember to think about it later. Also, I've learned that audiences sometimes have very specific expectations and they can get really irritated if it doesn't look or sound like what they expected. Sometimes when I worry that I'm just delivering another reliable entertainment experience, I try to interfere with these expectations. Also, sometimes people want something that they can't or they won't admit. And I'm thinking of Lil Nas and his graphic songs about sex and how he resents people who buy his records but at the same time criticize his taste. Getting to have both fun and indignation at the same time. I do what I do. You all want me to play the piano while I'm baking the cake? Now speaking of doing what you do, here he is, pregnant, with his album, and here he is, giving birth to his new record. I've often found myself in the wrong place or context, since the music I make doesn't easily fit into a category. When I started, the music world was still carefully divided into pop, rock, disco, experimental, ambient, and the word crossover was still new. Crossover is still not a really popular concept, so I often get booked in odd places. Now, in the early 80s, I was booked in the Berlin Jazz Festival, and I started with one of the long songs that I called Talking Songs. And there were lots of pauses in these songs. And it was in one of those pauses that went on just a little longer than usual that someone in the audience yelled, Play jazz! And I froze because I realized this is a jazz festival and he has a right to expect some jazz. And my second thought was, I don't know any jazz. Then, in 1980, I was in the Venice Biennale and they were a little short on public spaces, so they put me in a church. When they told me about it, I guess I was picturing more of a like, church basement, but they had set up all the equipment and speakers on this enormous pulpit. And at first, I tried to play the songs that I was planning on. I played a little violin. And I began to get an eerie feeling though, because right in front of me the whole time, I could see something that the audience couldn't. And it was an enormous plaster sculpture of Jesus hanging on the cross. And it was really intimidating. And so I decided to tell a really tasteless joke. And the joke was, why is it a good thing that Jesus lived in New Testament times instead of Old Testament times? And the answer is because in New Testament times, death was by crucifixion. And in Old Testament times, death was by stoning. So instead of people doing this, they would all be doing this. Plus, it would have 
changed a lot of things about architecture. All those cross-shaped ground plans would be much more unorganized, you know, like strewn all over the place, like things that have been thrown with, you know, a lot of force. A few years ago, the artist Ai Weiwei asked me to write a song about my motherland, and he said he would write a song about his motherland, and we'd play them together. So I invited him to play a concert with me in the Luminato Festival in Toronto. At the time, Ai Weiwei was under house arrest, and he was not allowed to leave the country, so he Skyped in. And we had a big screen, but everything that can go wrong with Skype at home went wrong in a concert, and we would just lose the connection and Ai Weiwei's face would freeze. East. The edge of the world. West. Those who came before me. I felt like that when the World Trade Center fell. We watched it on television. The odd thing was that it seemed like it fell in total silence. They never played the sound. Maybe because the loudness had turned all the recordings into white noise. So it was a picture with no sound. Two huge buildings that pulverized almost instantly, becoming dust and smoke. Nothing. Zero. A hole in the ground. Recently, I saw a show on Turkish TV and it was a state-sponsored cultural channel, and they rebroadcast live concerts. But between the pieces to fill the time, they let the cameras drift around to show the audience. And it was incredible. Almost everyone in the audience, both men and women, had Uzis strapped to their shoulders. Now, of course, a heavily armed audience is every performer's worst nightmare. And then a few years ago, I was playing a concert in Istanbul, and we'd been warned that security was very tight for Americans because of the Gulf War. And suddenly, I heard a volley of gunfire, and it did not sound like firecrackers. And for some reason, probably fear, I just kept playing until I heard another round and another, and I still didn't turn around to see if any of the band members were still there. And then the motor came out and he, and he whispered, it's the Americans. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, over at the Hilton. They're celebrating. It's the 4th of July. Lou and I used to wonder how it could be, given all the shootings in the country, that no one had ever tried to assassinate a musician. A person standing in a spotlight, not moving that much. Was the stage some kind of magic safe space? Then came Bataclan, November 13th, 2015. I was on my way to Paris to do a talk about the future of music in a Red Bull event. And I got the news and called them. They said the promoter of our event had been killed, but they wanted to go ahead anyway. If you come, we'll do it, they said. And I remember in the days after 9-11 how much people wanted to talk about things. They didn't want to go and hide in their houses. So I went. We talked about violence and how shocking that was, and since then there are more and more lone gunmen, like the one who killed 59 people from the 32nd floor of a hotel in Vegas in the country music show, and the bombing in Manchester Arena, and on and on. I've been part of many political movements for civil rights, women's rights, artists' rights, anti-war, pro-peace, pro-justice, prisoners' rights, climate change, starting with my work as a cartoonist for the Streetwall Journal. In 2011, we formed a group called Occupy Art. And we did a lot of actions focused on social and economic inequality, and especially the influence of corporations on government. We camped in Zuccotti Park as part of the Occupy Wall Street. And we marched. And it was largely peaceful. We scheduled an action for the plaza at Lincoln Center. It was a very cold, frosty December night at Lincoln Center, and we had planned an action around Philip Glass's opera Satyagraha, which was on at the Met. Satyagraha means truth force, and the opera is about the life of Gandhi and the power of civil disobedience. 
As the opera ended, people came streaming out dressed in slinky and elegant clothes, their ears still filled with music, and suddenly they see that the plaza is surrounded by police and barricades and filled with protesters. So, what does civil disobedience look like tonight in your city, loud in English? We ran the demonstration in Occupy Mike Czech style. Someone would speak and the inner circle would repeat it and then the next ring would repeat it until it radiated out to the edge like sound waves. We'd made an arrangement with Phil to come out after the opera and read to us. Satchikraha is in Sanskrit, but fortunately he read in English. When righteousness withers away and evil rules the land, we come into being age after age and take physical shape and move a man among men for the protection of good, thrusting back evil and setting virtue on her seat again. Like a lot of people after the 2016 election, I was exhausted and tired from not talking. It seemed like there'd never been a real national debate. It'd just been name calling in one long brawl. And I thought, what if we could organize a year long national conversation and each month look at one thing that we hadn't really talked about in the election, gun control, abortion, the climate. And since the internet had become kind of a crazy zone, I thought, why not use the libraries? They worked in such a different pace and with their stores of information, I thought they'd be ideal places to stage some real discussions. Plus, there's a network of libraries spread all over the country, and I thought maybe the big libraries could initiate the discussions and they could spread out through all the branches. Now, I'd gotten this idea a couple of years before when I did a project with Brian Eno in a library in Denmark with groups of people who meet there every Wednesday really early in the morning to sing. And I guess as school kids, they did a lot of group singing. They just kept, kept it going. But there was something I loved about being with people in a very convivial community way. And libraries seemed like a very good place to do this. So I got in touch with a couple of major libraries to float the idea of one topic per month for a year. And they said, great, love it. But we are government institutions and we can do it as long as it's not partisan. And I said, wait a second, let me ask you a question. If one of the topics is freedom of speech, would freedom of speech be considered partisan? And they said, well, yes. <coughs> uh, meanwhile, isn't it once again about time for a new national anthem. I mean, the old one is still pretty relevant, but we could build on some of those questions like, hey, does anyone smell any smoke or say, isn't that a country over there?
I want to tell you a story about a man who is looking for a country. And it's a long story. Around 1997, I was asked to come to Krems, a small town in Austria, to make an audio installation in the cultural center that was a 13th century church. And the space was really reverberant. It was very hard to figure out how to make a sound work with this mile-long reverb. The curators kept asking me what my project was, and one day, really to escape them, I ran up the crooked stairs in the old bell tower, and at the top of the tower, I could look out over the town, and in the middle of this perfect little Austrian town was a maximum security prison. And directly across from me was a guard tower. So I was in the bell tower, there was the guard tower, and there was a man pointing a machine gun at me. And I ran down the staircase and I found the curator and I said, I'm going to do something about the function of cameras and telepresence in our culture. So we'll build a video studio in the prison and we'll get the prisoner to sit a very long time. And then we'll make a life-size statue of the prisoner and put it in the apse of the church and then beam the image of the prisoner onto the statue of him sort of like a living statue. And it'll be about the attitudes of the church and the prison to the body, incarnation and incarceration. And weirdly, they said, that sounds great. And I thought, really? Is this actually a good idea? Plus, I think I was probably got this idea from the Illinois State Fair, where they projected a face, uh, a film, onto a statue of Lincoln, and they made him say the Gettysburg Address over and over and over. And plus, I had all sorts of like second and third thoughts about what it would mean to put the image of a convicted criminal in the apse where there's often an image of a deity. Now, a couple of weeks later, they said they discovered that according to Austrian law, prisoners do not actually own their own image. This is a 21st century dilemma as well, actually who actually owns your image and what can they do with it? Anyway, the ownership issue killed the project. And a couple of weeks later though, the Austrian, let's say, attorney general said, I love your project and you have special dispensation to do it, note the clerical language. Now in the end, there was just too much red tape and they, we didn't do it, but however, a year later, I did the project at the Prada Foundation in Milan with the great curator, Germano Chalant, collaborating with the San Vittore prison, which was in central Milan. Now, of course, the most difficult part of a collaboration like this is the potential for exploitation. So it was crucial to find a collaborator who genuinely wanted to do this for their own reasons. So Germano and I went to the prison uh, to meet the people there and explain the project and see if any of them would be interested in collaborating. Now the prisoners we met were in for life, principally for white collar crimes that involved, let's say, some very serious financial finagling. And these guys were very smart, very clever, fluent in Greek and Latin, and they were writing books and they were allowed to have knives and visitors and their wine collections and they they were very urbane and charming, and they were wearing like Armani, and uh, everything was super styling until you looked like down at their shoes, and, and they were wearing like uh, slippers. These guys were going nowhere ever. Otherwise, our meetings were a little bit like corporate board meetings, and because they were lawyers and they were skilled in the dark art of persuasion, they could just very subtly, before you knew it, just start to gradually turn your head in a certain direction and by using certain words or phrases or lifts of their eyebrows or the tiniest almost imperceptible winks, suddenly you were slowly nodding along with them, seeing their point of view, believing the whole thing was actually your own clever idea and they were all just congratulating you for being so perceptive. They were real masters. Now, basically, they had already decided who the collaborator was going to be and they were just kind of winding me up. And the whole process had left me looking directly at a man in the corner, his name was Santino. He was a bank robber and a murderer. And I said, Santino, if we collaborate, what do you make of this project? And he said, I see it as a virtual escape. 
And I said, you're my man. Santino was a writer of books and plays, and we talked a lot, and we eventually became uh, pretty good friends. And meanwhile, we were making the statue gradually, creating it from a combination of casts and carving, and then eventually testing the projection. And we often met at the prison to discuss the project. And the first night I was there, I was invited to stay for dinner, a uh, menu, lobster ravioli. One of the inmates was a pastry chef. And on Easter, he made dozens and dozens of little white marzipan lambs for the crew. And he presented them on a tray arranged in orderly flocks, tiny, identical symbols of purity, innocence, and uniformity. They were white, perfect little sculptures. They looked a lot like the project. Now, after a lot of preparation, digging up the streets in Milan to lay video cable and building the studio, the exhibition finally opened. And it was called Dal Vivo, since the word life in Italian didn't mean serving a life sentence. Dal Vivo is more like drawn from life, like, like a still life, which was a few degrees from the meaning I was looking for, but still kind of acceptable. Now, Santino had trained for a long time for this, and he sat perfectly still, although you could see him kind of breathing. And in the end, he didn't look like a prisoner at all. He looked regal, distant. He looked like a judge. And almost every day, his girlfriend came to the Prada Foundation and, and stood next to the statue. In another room, there were six small statues, and each told a story about transformation, representation, the relationship of time and crime, the alchemy of blood and gold, the body and money. And one of the statues told a story attributed both to the poet Robert Graves and to Borges. And it went like this. You know, Alexander the Great wasn't killed at the Battle of Macedon like everybody thinks he was. In fact, he was captured during the battle by a huge tribe of men and forced to fight in their army as a slave. 30 years went by and finally his captors, who could see what a great fighter he was, decided to pay him. So they gave him a bag of gold coins and Alexander took one of the coins and he looked at it and on it was his own picture. And he said, this is from the time when I was Alexander the Great. You know, I'd always wanted to do a prison project in the United States, partly because our prison population is the highest in the world. One out of every 35 Americans is in prison. And sometime in the 80s, the privatization of prisons was oddly coinciding with a sudden increase in the number of criminals. Now, was it a sudden surge in the number of bad guys? Or what do businesses need? They need customers. 2014, the Park Avenue Armory asked me to do a project and proposed working with a number of upstate prisons to make a dozen of these statues. Like Egyptian pharaohs in two rows, uh, like in the afterlife, made up of 12 prisoners from upstate. It turned out to be fairly easy to work with prisons. There were already cameras in there, and prisoners were getting used to being actors and stars in their own shows. So why are you dressed as a clown? It's just having fun for Halloween. Like, but it's not Halloween yet. It's the month. It's the spirit. This is a shotgun that he had. We cleared it. But he had it tucked in here. That fits really well for just finding the shotgun in, in a parking lot, huh? The plans for the project were getting more and more advanced. And then one day, we got a notice from Homeland Security that said, basically, you will never do this project in the United States of America. It was fairly clear. And then the armory said, OK, what's plan B? And I said, plan B, plan B. I don't have a plan B. So I came up with one very quickly, really. It involved a kind of ruined Western landscape with uh, miniature cowboys played by kids with mustaches glued on and lots of vinyl records playing around the space. And, and then a parade of scenes with cave people and key events from American history and two-sided plays and 
Miniature ponies were also part of Plan B, and suddenly we had to print posters and banners. You know, sometimes how you have to do press before you've even written the piece. So we got some ponies and we brought them into the armory uh, for the photo shoot. And my sister, who's a horse trainer, said, you know, if ponies were people, they'd all be in jail. I mean, they're mean, kicking and biting as they clip-clopped around the governor's room in the armory. But at this point, I was panicking. I didn't really want to do a parade of history around the ruins of the West, and I wanted to see if there was a way to work with another kind of prisoner. And it was at this point that we made contact with a group in London called Reprieve, and Reprieve represents detainees in Guantanamo, and they arranged for me to meet with one of the detainees. Mohamed al Gurani was the youngest detainee at Guantanamo, and he had been released from the prison about five years before I met him. And he was moving around Africa, looking for a way to get his citizenship back. And I talked to him several times on the phone, and he agreed to do the project principally for his American brothers, as he put it. And Mohamed had been bought by the U.S. for $5,000 in the sweep of mosques right after 9-11, picked principally because he was Saudi the profile we were looking for. Now the project began to turn around the difference between Mohammed's story and the story of the US government. The US government case was based on the somewhat fanciful story that Mohammed was a spy who had, as an eight-year-old goat herder, somehow made it to London on his own to work in a terrorist cell. Like a lot of detainees in Guantanamo, Mohammed was unlucky, wrong place, wrong time, most Guantanamo detainees, as I learned, ended up never receiving a trial because they weren't even charged. So since they were never charged, they could also never be exonerated. They live in a Kafka-esque limbo. Now the story of Mohammed's incarceration, his time in solitary, his broken teeth, his scars, it was almost impossible to listen to it, but he was full of stories so sad and so positive at the same time. I went to meet him in Ghana, where he was living, and the project began to move forward very quickly. Then we built a, a video studio, and it was during Ramadan, and Mohammed sat in the studio, motionless, for long periods of time. Meanwhile, in New York, we began to build a huge statue of him out of styrofoam, the size of the Lincoln Memorial. We beamed his image into the armory live from Africa. And he sat for several days in New York, and the installation was called Habeas Corpus. People came every day, and they stayed for hours, sitting there listening to him talk. Some were lying down. Some people did Tai Chi. Some came just to lie in the field of the rotating stars made by the mirror ball. We also did a concert one of the nights playing with several musicians. Mohammed talked about some of the things that had happened to him and it was eerie listening to this huge talking statue. In addition, there was another room with videos of Mohammed talking about his life in Guantanamo and lots of written information so people could learn about details of his case. And one of the stories that Mohammed told was about a fellow detainee who told his interrogator that he had a dream that a submarine had come to rescue the prisoners. And the next day, Guantanamo Bay was filled with helicopters and ships and troops looking for the dream submarine. Guantanamo is a dark dream like the imaginary nukes that brought the U.S. into a protracted war. It is made of illusion and fear and rage. I talked to Mohammed a lot about what happened to him in Guantanamo, and no matter what horrendous thing he was describing, he never showed anger or sadness. The only time I saw him cry was when he was describing his friend Shakir, who had been his friend in Guantanamo. That was what made him cry the memory of someone who had helped him. Now, in the drill hall, there was a camera way at the top of the ceiling, aimed so that Mohammed could adjust himself to match the statue. 
But you know how it is in the 21st century. Everybody knows where the cameras are, in, like in a parking garage or entrance to a building. You have like a second sense for surveillance. And people quickly realized that if, if they turned around and looked up at the camera, that he could see them too. So they began to bring guitars and signs with messages written to him and they made gestures and held out their hands and their... there was no audio so they just kind of acted things out and began to mouth some words i'm sorry When I was in Ghana preparing the studio with Mohammed, we visited El Nino, one of the slave castles on the coast. Built in 1482 by the Portuguese, it was one of the first posts in the slave trade. We walked around the fortress that had a lot of cannons, went down into the underground cells. Slaves were packed in here for weeks in the dark, and when they left, they were herded down a tunnel directly into the holds of the ship without ever seeing the light. The destination of these slave ships from the coasts of Africa was the Caribbean, the market for the New World, and the trip had a strange resemblance to the one that Mohammed had made, handcuffed and blindfolded, put on a plane and dropped into Guantanamo. Right before the pandemic, I went to Morocco, where Mohammed was looking for work and I went there to talk about a new version of habeas corpus we wanted to mount at the Hirshhorn Museum. He was still unable, eight years after his release, to get citizenship. He's blocked as an accused terrorist, even though he was never tried. He had the stigma of Gitmo. And just a couple of months ago, he sent me a letter and he asked me to give it to Joe Biden. Now the letter asks not for an apology, but for an acknowledgement which in many ways is much more stark. It's one thing to say, I put my knee on your neck until you were dead. And it's another thing to say, I'm sorry I put my knee on your neck until you were dead. Finally, within the last week, there have been some official acknowledgements from the US government that the enhanced interrogation was actually torture. And the implication was that when we're threatened, we'll do anything, we just won't admit what we're doing. Now, I've written a cover letter that goes like this. Dear Mr. President, I am forwarding you a letter addressed to you by my collaborator. He is currently appearing in an exhibition not far from you at the Hirshhorn Museum, and I would be happy to give you a tour and introduce you to Mohammed, who is appearing virtually telling a story about Guantanamo. Now, his letter will outline his reasons for writing to you, but let me say that I'm hoping that the recent developments regarding the illegality of the treatment of prisoners like Mohammed, along with other factors, will encourage you to finally close Guantanamo. Now, I am CCing the vice president and will also be sending her a copy of this letter under separate cover. And I look forward to hearing from you. I'd like to tell you as a kind of PS that when I wrote to JFK as a 12 year old, he not only answered me in an informative and specific letter, but he sent a telegram and roses, just saying. Now in CCing the vice president, I'm going to be using her full title. I don't know why this wasn't pointed out on the last election, but Kamala means Lotus, and her middle name Devi means goddess. And so she is Lotus Goddess. And because she's both vice president of the country and president of the Senate, her full title is Madam Vice Potus Lotus Goddess Harris. There's a book called Enlightenment Unfolds by the 13th century Zen master Dogen. And in this book, he tells several stories that are hundreds of years old. And one was about the meeting of a teacher who came from India to visit an emperor in China, Emperor Wu. And so the two meet, and the emperor says, you know, I've done so many things, built temples, copied sutras, and supported the monks, and I'd like to know what all this is worth. And the teacher said, there is no worth. 
And the emperor said, so why is that? And the teacher said, worth is empty and is not in things. The emperor said, what have you come to teach? And the teacher said, emptiness, vast emptiness. The emperor said, who is it that faces me? And the teacher said, I don't know. You know, I really admire people who have no idea who they are or even that they are anyone at all. So I kept on reading and in the rest of the book there were these koans and poems and a lot of lists of things to look out for when you're on a pilgrimage. And one list was one, don't pay attention to loud noises and shouting. Two, don't watch herds of pigs. Three, don't stare at big fish, the ocean, bad pictures, hunchbacks, or puppets. Four. Don't pretend you have something in your closed fist if you don't. I want to wrap this up by talking about a few of the people who've been my teachers. My first grade teacher wore a huge floppy hat and she arrived after the bell rang. Our lives were ruled by bells. They were more like buzzers and they would ring, you'd put your pencil down, they rang again, you went out to recess, they rang again, you came back. But the teacher would come in after the bell and she'd go, people! let's paint some very big tomatoes, like put lots of dripping juice, and then she would just also just leave before the bell rang, and she'd just disappear. And I thought, I'm going to be that person. Now, as a young student, I worked with Saul Lewitt at the School of Visual Arts, and I spent a lot of time looking at his drawings of numbers. And one day I said, these look a lot like musical scores. And he said, write one. So I wrote something called Quartet for Saul Lewitt based on this series, and I have to say it sounded exactly like his drawing. Now around then, I was asked to show my sculpture in a big show in Rome, and this was a huge thing for me, and I packed all my work and showed up there. But the show had been postponed for two weeks, and the promoters just forgot to tell the artist. So Saul had arrived there too early, and we just decided to walk around Rome, and so we just drifted around for two weeks in Rome with no map and no plan. And one afternoon, we arrived at an empty plaza and it was a very cold and drizzly November day. And there was a man with an easel set up and he was wearing a beret and he had a palette and he was making a painting and he was actually doing this. And I was about to make some kind of snarky remark about this and Saul said, you know, it really takes dedication to paint on a day like today. And I'm thinking of the famous letter he wrote to his friend, the sculptor Eva Hess, about how to be free as an artist. And he had advice like, try to do your worst work. You'll learn a lot. Stop worrying and second guessing. Can't you just leave the word world and art out and stop fondling your own ego. Empty your mind and just do. I don't believe in ghosts, although I have seen three of them. Recently, we played Quartet for Solowit at Mass Mocha in an installation of Solowit's work. And I don't know how this happens. But Saul just showed up. Is it something about music or the magic of numbers? I just want to talk briefly about one more person, the writer and professor, Barbara Novak, who taught American Light at Barnard College. And she was the only teacher I knew who allowed you to see her actually thinking. And she would just pace back and forth in front of a painting, just without really 
No. Saying much. And it actually made us kind of nervous, you know, we thought, did she forget what she was going to say or was she having some kind of breakdown? And, and it went on and on and, and we began slowly just looking at the paintings ourselves, you know, and wondering things like, why is light falling like that? I mean, what, what does that mean? I'm still in touch and a few weeks ago she said, I want to read you an interesting part from a book I was reading called Carrying the Fire by Michael Collins, the Apollo 11 astronaut who spent time passing over the dark side of the moon while he waited to pick up the two other astronauts. And she read us a description of what it was like to be in that kind of darkness. The unlit moon, a circular void, erasing that part of the sky. And what it was like to see the pinpoint stars in this darkness with no atmosphere. And as he put it, stars minus the twinkling. American light and American darkness. We're at the end of the fifth talk now, and I'm thinking of Calvino and his unfinished series. I love his memos, and they've become guidelines for me. He began his series with lightness, and I've been working in the opposite direction, until the next and final talk in this series will be about air, the sky, and the future. So we're going to start by looking up. Cowboys ain't easy to love and they're harder to hold They'd rather give you a song, diamonds or gold Lone star belt buckles and old faded Levi's And each night begins a new day If you don't understand him, he don't die young Probably just right away Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys Don't let them pick guitars and drive in old trucks Let them be doctors and lawyers and such And mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys They'll never stay home and they're always alone Even with someone they love Cowboys like smoky old pool rooms and clear mountain mornings Little warm puppies and children and girls of the night Them that don't know won't like him and them that do sometimes won't know how to take him he ain't wrong he's just different his pride won't let him do things to make you think he's right mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys don't let them pick guitars and drive them over Wow, Laurie. <laughs> really wow. Uh, that was yeah. so that was so incredibly beautiful. Thank you. And and you you managed to capture the city as a as a truly living organism. And I kept thinking about sort of it breathing and sort of expanding and contracting both with time but also like breath. Uh, and and I was curious a little bit about the the, the way too that you created this limitless present that is like a poem that can be revisited or retold in any order. So really very, very cool. I wanted to ask you a little bit about so many things, but a time question, which is when thinking about limitless present, I'm curious about, this is us gonna say a dive right in, flow states. And, and do you think about flow states? Cause the poem, the poem, the whole talk tonight felt to me like a flow state. Yeah. 
That, that's exactly, I, I'm so glad you picked out that phrase because I thought it kind of got lost a little bit, but it is that. It's uh, and it's a perfect description to say flow state uh, because sometimes, you, especially when you're walking around the city, you do feel um, all of those eras, you know, just kind of, aren't you over there by that 300 year old elm tree? I am by the elm tree. I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but I was also mindful of Boston where, where this series is based is of course the great city on the hill. And it's also known, known as the hub of the sort of, you know, impossible in all things. So I thought that yeah. there's, there's a lot of very cool things in that. Um, possible. Yes. Well, it's actually called, I think it's called, I, I wrote it down. Um, it is called the, well, it's the city of, it is the city on the hill, which is always the beacon of hope that's from a million years ago. And then it's also, uh, yes, it's the hub of, of the invisible, I think. I don't know. Anyway, um, there's so many uh, questions that people have for you. And I have questions too. One of them was also about, I was interested in, and I've always wanted to ask you this, I think of you as someone who thrives in liminal spaces. I think of you as someone who is in some ways happiest like on an airplane, on the way to somewhere. And I was curious about that relationship and then equally to add a two-parter to it, to the relationship of pauses because so much of your work too is about the space between things and the silence and the pause in, in very much both a visual musical and language kind of way can you can you talk about the pause well first of all the air i'm not I, I do like air a lot and and i try to leave enough in so that people this one was very rapid fire so i'm afraid it didn't have quite enough air because it's just coming at you like this because there was just too much to say with what's going on right now but um yeah the the so I wish that there had been a little bit more time to have things just sort of sit there. I do um, like to just stop. And so the, the, so the point of like freezing this image at one point was, was just to kind of um, remind myself that, you know, uh, it, of the dreamlike aspect of what it is to kind of move through the, the world and try to sustain some uh, idea of who you are you are uh, at that point so it is fascinating though because this whole yeah. last couple of years have been this period of sort of incredible like acceleration and things just almost hurtling through the atmosphere in the world and yet we've been on pause which yes. is you know its own dissonance uh there are a couple yeah do you have thoughts about that uh well uh no i think that summed it up <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are a couple of really good questions that I wanted to ask you that, that other folks, oh. I have of course 200 for myself, but I'll, I wanna give others some space. So one is a question about uh, cities. And the question goes like this. Some theorists have described how cities constantly reinvent, evolve and overwrite histories as a palimpsest, which translate to as again rubbed smooth. Would you attribute the smoothness to New York and can you relate to contributing to the smoothing of space ready for overriding through walking through the city? I feel walking through is not so smooth. It's, it's, it's very rough and rubbing against things because, and also because it's so full of, that's why I like to put those old, old people mm -hmm. on the Upper West Side sitting on their bench uh, because you kind of feel them there. So I think that that to me doesn't feel so smooth. It feels very, very um, it, like it's vibrating all the time with uh, all the, the time frames it's in. So uh, I was trying to convey that part. I don't feel the balance of smoothness so much. Um, uh, so, but I have to think about that one. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I always think about the people sitting in these new pedestrian plazas, and I find it very <laughs> worrying. I'm like the it's only the only really? shield we have. Yeah, I think the only shield they have against a bus is like a little cafe chair. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. that's a, it's a lot. It's a very trusting. It really worries thing me about how they're gonna, you know, stop that from happening. Um, yeah. There's so many good questions. Another one is in the project with people in prison, you mentioned that ethics were an important thing to consider. Can you speak to that? And what kinds of things are you thinking about uh, in terms of actions and engagements when you that you're working with and you think about ethics? Um, that just reminded me of, uh, I used to put a lot of phrases on 
tape bows so that I could play them forward and backwards. And um, one was a quote from Lenin that sounded good forwards and backwards. I forgot how it sounded backwards, but forwards it was ethics is the aesthetics of the future. And I always liked that concept and wondered if it was really what, what, was, what was in that because secretly I, I, uh, they're, they're very bound to, for me. You know, and 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 yet at the same time, I was trying to make the point of how uh, how strident it can be when you're just trying to push your agenda and then wrap it up in some some artistic idea. Very very tricky, so tricky to do. So I really admire when people are able to do a um, work that has a, a kind of um, uh, ethical center, and yet at the same time, um, I don't. If I had a choice between something that was true, let's say, or I considered it true, something that was beautiful, I would choose the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I I would just be moved over there, mm -hmm. just because it's it's um it's more of a, a visceral and right. and a sensual thing, and it's not something that you think of or that you can convince yourself is very important. I mean, it, it's so I, I feel that. So, so it's something that you feel rather than you than you right. let's believe because <laughs> belief is tricky well, yes absolutely it, it, and it leads us to another question which is somebody is asking how do you envision ways in which future performance site art might address climate and ecological crisis and i think that's interesting to think about because just by making art we're creating trash you know? yeah, and that, that's true we're, we're creating more of a and, and you know wood chips and no but i'm curious <laughs> you know yeah but we can't stop breathing you know so oh that's one of my favorite when you we were mentioning uh, breath before i was just thinking of that really beautiful book called i think when when breath becomes air absolutely yeah i love that um love title that. nice title but uh as far as is um uh diving in and feeling something as um, intense as, as climate change. I mean, it's, it's a really amazing subject, mm -hmm. of course. So we'll see what, where artists take that. I don't know. I mean, the great thing about this is that, that um, uh, you can't predict what people are going to do. So what young artists are going to do with, with climate is going to be amazing. Um, I, I just... For me, it's the, the toughest thing for me is, is, is the artwork, art, art slash design work that is about people going, we have ways to solve this thing and we're going to do, you know, and, and I'm, I'm like, well, well, I hope so. But um, I, I, I find that uh, is ringing in a, in a weird way. And on the other hand, um, I, I'm not ready to write a requiem for the world. Uh, well, it's it's also a little bit the 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 the, the if the, if someone presents you with a directive, especially presented as art as directive, it's complicated yeah. and it's hard to it know is. how. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. It tells you how to. Well, art tells you how to feel. I think in a lot of ways it can, and so it's it can be super manipulative. Too, you got to oh, yes. be, gotta be uh, careful about that. Yeah. Did, have you found that in in in, in your work? Well, you know, I feel like for me, I'm always trying to, if not answer, I'm, I'm never able to answer a question because I don't think, I don't think that that, for me, that's not what literature or art can do, but it can ask yeah. questions yeah. and it can push you to sort of look at the world differently, which I think about it so much of what you're, you're always doing that because you're always like, hey, look over there. And hey, what happens if you look over there and then you look there? What does that combine into? Uh, and the whole sort of beauty of the digression. Yeah, it's a perfect description of your books, which is how I feel when I read them. Kind of trouble, but, but with a lot of stuff going on. Because you really, uh, and I really appreciate uh, the lack of conclusion. Yeah, well, there's, <laughs> and that's, you know, and it's, so there is, as we know, there is no conclusion. There's, there's so many questions. I want to go jump into two, a couple more that are related. One is just somebody asking, can you talk about the image behind you? Oh, yeah. Um, this is some, an old photograph. Uh, let me get out of the way for a second. Of of a of a an Indian encampment, and it, it's a gelatin print, and I really love it because it, it reminds uh, one of the things uh, that I think we went there or near there, which was uh, an Indian camp um, of Stephen Talkhouse. He was one of the last uh, Talkhouse Indians out 
where uh, out on Long Island, and his job was uh, to run books along this library path <laughs> from like Southampton to Montauk, connecting. So if you if you your book was uh, you got it out in Southampton, he would return it for you. He'd run. He was a great runner, and he had a camp out near the, the water. And this is. I think in the late 19th century, but there's still the smoky remains of it. And you could see what a good place for a camp, you know, lots of deer, lots of fish, lots of, you know, uh, all, all sorts of uh, fish and game. Uh, and, uh, and you can still see the smoky ruins of it. So I, I find that like uh, very beautiful. So this is a, a tattered old photograph of a, of a, of a camp of the talk house. Uh, oh no, not not of the tacos, but it reminded oh, me yes, of the tacos. Right, right. yeah. uh, somebody wants to know, and I have, I equally want to know. I'm curious about they want to know about your process for for developing these lectures. And I kept thinking, is she using green screen? Green? How are you doing this? Because it's so wonderful that literally your lectures are illustrated, but not with the old fashioned slideshow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the new slideshow. I think you know, um, this is a this is a green screen that, um, let me see if I can I'll take it off for a second. Oh, well, but anyway, trust me, it's green back there. <laughs> it makes your hair tinged to sort of green uh -huh. too. So you can like uh, be kind of anywhere. What's really fun is putting things um, in front of it. So that that's how I, um, uh, I actually the um, tech director here, Jason Stern made the jail so that you can be in, in but you can be in the image too with things in front of you. So that is a lot of fun to experiment uh, rather than standing in front of a flat thing. So I think that has, um, I mean, living in the world of Zoom has, has, has um, some advantages, don't you think? I think it's, I, I, I think with what you're doing, most, mostly I'm just sitting here with the same, you know, whatever behind me. Um, but I think that, that it's been really interesting to see what people are able to do and to use it literally as a uh, illustrative platform. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very cool. You can do whole concerts that way. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> never leave your living room. Oh, it, yeah. yeah never I know. Room. It's interesting oh, because, you know, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is I was thinking about, and, and somebody else had a similar question in the chat. You always seem so optimistic <laughs> and, and joyous and, and really enthusiastic about things. And I kept thinking about, and you and I talk about this sometimes a little bit, the space between optimism and terror. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, the notion that the sun's coming out, but you might get burned to a crisp. And I'm, yeah. I'm curious if you can talk a bit about that. And, I, and I'm, I wanted to know if it's sort of, if it's changed for you over the years, if like even sort of, do you, as the world is warming, do you feel yourself getting more anxious or do you feel the benefit of age of just going, screw this, it's all, you know, I don't think screw this. No, I, I, um, it, it's one of the, it, it's a, it, it's very intense moment to be alive. And, and just to be able to see this is mind blowing. So uh, I, I think, but on the other hand, um, I'm not necessarily optimistic. I'm a, I'm a very dark sweet. I mean, I'll see the dark side of anything, you know, but the thing about, about, um, optimism for me is I'm only doing it for my own convenience because you know it's just if you're given a choice between seeing the absolutely dreadful side and the, and the wonderful side um, choose the wonderful side because you'll you'll have a better life you know it, it neither neither things make sense you know it's not the world's going to collapse nobody knows this stuff nobody nobody knows that so if you choose to see it, it as collapsing or you choose to see it as turning into some like fantastic thing, think of it turning into something fantastic because you'll just be happier. That's all. It's, it's, that's the only reason I see it like that. I just have, I have a better time. So by, by being joyous, it, it gives you greater tolerance for the... <laughs> it's more fun. It's, it's really quite simple. It's just, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have more fun. Right. If you whatever it to is. That. Yeah. I mean, whatever you call fun. <laughs> a lot of other people call fun something else, which is also, I mean, but I, I, I also uh, love the love the dark side. So mm -hmm. <laughs> R 
we're, well, we're coming into the dark season now where they said, I saw something the other day where somebody said, like, who is the person who said that it's wonderful when it gets dark at, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon? And the answer was no one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I like that. I, I like it. I, I, find, um, I find darkness um, uh, uh, a really great time of, of the day slash night. I, I, I don't, um, and, and when the time, uh, when the day gets shorter, I, I, I enjoy that. I, uh, I don't know, so go shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> I, have two, I have two more that I'm gonna ask you that are from the chat. Uh, one is inspired by the concert for the dogs, uh, I'd like to ask Laurie her thoughts about how to empath empathize more, spelled incorrectly, not by me, okay. Empathize, empathize more with the non-human inhabitants of the cities in creative work. The non-human inhabitants of the cities. Oh, okay. Um, well, one of the things I'm gonna talk about, I think in the next uh, talk will be some uh, music experiments that I've done with animals and not, uh, dogs, but more recently chimps, and so I uh, hope to put that question off until uh, next time. Uh, uh, well, not that there are any chimps around the city, although there were, there, um, did you read that book, Nim Chimpsky? Beautiful book. Yes, absolutely, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a chimp who was, uh, was grew up in a, with a, a family, which yeah. is not a good thing, you know, in a way. And then was put in a lab in Colombia. I mean, and they, they did a lot of stuff. And then the, I think they something like ran out of funding or something, and he, they just left him in the way back. And um, five years went by, and then he's in the in the cage. Somebody passes, and he's signing in American Sign Language. Get me the hell out of this cage! And she's wow. <laughs> so uh, uh, animals can speak uh, to you very clearly um uh without uh, they're not used to the blah, blah blah you know but they're uh so i think um i wonder who, what animals this person's thinking about like city animals they're they're I know, rats I have a huge too. amount of rats now i mean have you noticed that i mean it's, i know that all the restaurants are outside they're it's, rats the size of buicks <laughs> out there now <laughs> <laughs> they're huge i they're saw huge. one riding a city bike just yesterday <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that would be funny though the right you know the rat that's always outside for on, when buildings are on strike if the yeah. strike rat in costume was riding the city bike holding a pizza because you often see rats in new york city eating pizza. slices of pizza totally yeah. they, they are like pizza. yeah they do yeah, i know who doesn't you know so so i have there's one last one i'm going to ask you and it's so interesting um i was thinking about always and i've always thought this about you for years and i never ask you about it um which is once a person becomes well known, it always seems to me that it's harder for them to look outward because people are always looking at them and it sort of interferes with like your processing, your vision or whatever. And I remember years ago, you used to talk about the person who said on the street, oh, there goes another Laurie Anderson clone. <laughs> so here's the wackiest thing. The Laurie Anderson clone comment person wrote in the chat. They've reached out. Oh, really? Closing <laughs> thing. Hi from the dumb kid who called you another Laurie Anderson clone circa 1983 on the street. In my defense, I really didn't know it was you. What would you say about the function of the city, the dashing together of differences? And then the person signs with an anonymity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a great place to be anonymous. It, this, this town is really wonderful because people see you and they don't see you. Uh, and they uh, and also everyone's good at sliding past everyone because everyone has these personas that they put out. I mean, uh, I always thought of that as kind of a kind of a joke that you would construct this thing that was supposed to walk around representing you, which was an utter fiction. I mean, it was just like I never believed in that ever. Uh, I always thought that that was idiotic and and yet very convenient to do and and so and now that um, people do that rather routinely you know create a, a plausible representation of themselves that they send to parties and they're, 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 that's that's who they who they are in the world I'm sure you know uh, all about that too um, and and also just to to be able not to 
uh, think about it. What helped me a lot was never to read anything about myself, mm -hmm. which is, is, I've been probably maybe 10 years now that I just I see something that written, I'm like, whoa. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't either. Yeah. I don't even, I don't read, I mentioned this, I don't read book reviews. I'll, I'll let somebody tell me, was yeah. it okay? Was it not okay? Exactly. Not, I don't want to know the details because you can't change it anyway. So what's the difference? <laughs> it's a little, like oh, a little no, you can't. I, I, I just realized that, uh, you know, uh, that I have some paintings in the Hirshhorn and they, and I do go in and work on them now that they're up. It's been a dream come true for me to, to like just touch them up. Never too late. Yeah, no, never too late. We should tell people as we're, we're winding down now, but Laurie has a show that is open at the Hershore Museum in Washington until March something? No, March. July. July, <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no rush, people. <laughs> That's fantastic. But I will tell you, it is truly, truly an amazing show. It's, it's <laughs> like heartbreakingly brilliant. It's amazing. So oh, okay. I just want to put that out there. And then I want to remind people that the next lecture is December 8th. Uh, at 6 p.m., I do believe. I'm sure they'll get emails about maybe it. Maybe same time, five, maybe five, something like that. Six, you know, depending that. on where in the it's world you are. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and Laurie, just thank you so much. It's such a treat to spend time with you, and these lectures have been amazing. Uh, oh, it's it's been next, thank you so much. Thank you. For doing this. <laughs> oh, anytime. It's okay. December 8th at 5 p.m., you're correct. Yeah. It's four o'clock <laughs> in the Midwest. Um, exactly. <laughs> it's four. Lori, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Em. And we'll see really you again soon. Really fun to talk with you. Okay. Right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>